Bumaris Castle in Bumaris, Wales. King Edward conquered North Wales in the 1200s, then built a ring of castles around it to defend his newly won territory. Bumaris Castle is one of them or, to be more accurate, nearly one of them. Before construction on Bumaris was completed, the king's finances and attention were redirected to his military campaign in Scotland. The stout fortress was never fully finished but the concentric design of walls within walls has been praised by historians as a triumph of medieval military architecture. After changing hands several times in the ensuing centuries, Bumaris eventually fell into ruin. But today's visitors likely won't notice anything amiss, as the castle is still impressively looming and large, having been restored beginning in 1925. And as we can see in our image, Bumaris even comes complete with the requisite medieval moat. Bumaris Castle, located in the town of the same name on the Isle of Anglesey in Wales, was built as part of Edward I's campaign to conquer the north of Wales after 1282. Plans were probably first made to construct the castle in 1284, but this was delayed due to lack of funds and work only began in 1295 following the Madagap Llewellyn Uprising. A substantial workforce was employed in the initial years under the direction of James of St. George. Edward's invasion of Scotland soon diverted funding from the project, however, and work stopped, only recommencing after an invasion scare in 1306. When work finally ceased around 1330 a total of £15,000 had been spent, a huge sum for the period, but the castle remained incomplete. Bumaris Castle was taken by Welsh forces in 1403 during the Owain Glendore Rebellion, but recaptured by royal forces in 1405. Following the outbreak of the English Civil War in 1642, the castle was held by forces loyal to Charles I, holding out until 1646 when it surrendered to the parliamentary armies. Despite forming part of a local royalist rebellion in 1648 the castle escaped sliding and was garrisoned by Parliament. In March 1592 the Welsh Roman Catholic priest and later martyr William Davis was imprisoned in the castle, and was eventually hanged, drawn and quartered there on July 27, 1593. Following the outbreak of the English Civil War in 1642, the castle was held by forces loyal to Charles I, holding out until 1646 when it surrendered to the parliamentary armies. Despite forming part of a local royalist rebellion in 1648, the castle escaped sliding and was garrisoned by Parliament, but fell into ruin around 1660, eventually forming part of a stately home and park in the 19th century. In the 21st century, the ruined castle is still a tourist attraction. Historian Arnold Taylor described Bumaris Castle as Britain's most perfect example of symmetrical concentric planning. The fortification is built of local stone, with a moated outer ward guarded by 12 towers and two gatehouses, overlooked by an inner ward with two large, D-shaped gatehouses and six massive towers. The inner ward was designed to contain ranges of domestic buildings and accommodation able to support two major households. The south gate could be reached by ship, allowing the castle to be directly supplied by sea. UNESCO considers Bumaris to be one of the finest examples of late 13th century and early 14th century military architecture in Europe, and it is classed as a World Heritage Site. 13th-14th centuries the kings of England and the Welsh princes had vied for control of North Wales since the 1070s and the conflict had been renewed during the 13th century, leading to Edward I intervening in North Wales for the second time during his reign in 1282. Edward invaded with a huge army, pushing north from Carmarthen and westwards from Montgomery and Chester. Edward decided to permanently colonize North Wales and provisions for its governance were set out in the Statute of Rodlin, enacted on March 3, 1284. Wales was divided into counties and shires, emulating how England was governed, with three new shires created in the northwest, Carnarvon, Maranath, and Anglesey. 
New towns with protective castles were established at Canavan and Harlech, the administrative centers of the first two shires, with another castle and walled town built in nearby Conwy, and plans were probably made to establish a similar castle and settlement near the town of Lanfiz on Anglesey. Lanfiz was the wealthiest borough in Wales and largest in terms of population, an important trading port and on the preferred route from North Wales to Ireland. The huge cost of building the other castles, however, meant that the Lanfiz project had to be postponed. In 1294 Madagap Llewellyn rebelled against English rule. The revolt was bloody and amongst the casualties was Roger de Peelston, the sheriff of Anglesey. Edward suppressed the rebellion over the winter and once Anglesey was reoccupied in April 1295 he immediately began to progress the delayed plans to fortify the area. The chosen site was called Beaumaris, meaning Fair Marsh, whose name derives from the Norman-French Beaumaris, and in Latin the castle was termed a Bello Marisco. This was about 1 mile from Lanfiz and the decision was therefore taken to move the Welsh population of Lanfiz some 12 miles 19 km, southwest, where a settlement by the name of Newborough was created for them. The deportation of the local Welsh opened the way for the construction of a prosperous English town, protected by a substantial castle. The castle was positioned in one corner of the town, following a similar town plan to that in the town of Conwy, although in Bumaris no town walls were constructed at first, despite some foundations being laid. Work began in the summer of 1295, overseen by Master James of St. George. James had been appointed the master of the King's works in Wales, reflecting the responsibility he had in their construction and design. From 1295 onwards, Bumaris became his primary responsibility and more frequently he was given the title Magister Operationum de Bello Marisco. The work was recorded in considerable detail on the pipe rolls, the continuous records of medieval royal expenditure, and, as a result, the early stages of construction at Bumaris are relatively well understood for the period. A huge amount of work was undertaken in the first summer, with an average of 1,800 workmen, 450 stonemasons and 375 quarriers on the site. This consumed around £270 a week in wages and the project rapidly fell into arrears, forcing officials to issue leather tokens instead of paying the workforce with normal coinage. The centre of the castle was filled with temporary huts to house the workforce over the winter. The following spring, James explained to his employers some of the difficulties and the high costs involved. In case you should wonder where so much money could go in a week, we would have you know that we have needed and shall continue to need 400 masons, both cutters and layers, together with 2,000 less skilled workmen, 100 carts, 60 wagons and 30 boats bringing stone and sea coal 200 quarrymen 30 smiths, and carpenters for putting in the joists and floorboards and other necessary jobs. All this takes no account of the garrison, nor of purchases of material of which there will have to be a great quantity. The men's pay has been and still is very much in arrears, and we are having the greatest difficulty in keeping them because they have simply nothing to live on. The construction slowed during 1296, although debts continued to build up, and work dropped off further the following year, stopping entirely by 1300, by when around £11,000 had been spent. The halt was primarily the result of Edward's new wars in Scotland, which had begun to consume his attention and financial resources, but it left the castle only partially complete, the inner walls and towers were only a fraction of their proper height and the north and northwest sides lacked outer defences altogether. In 1306 Edward became concerned about a possible Scottish invasion of North Wales, but the unfinished castle had already fallen into a poor state of repair. Work recommenced on completing the outer defences, first under James' direction and then, after his death in 1309, Master Nicholas de Durnford. This work finally halted in 1330 with the castle still not built to its intended height, by the end of the project, £15,000 had been spent, 
a colossal sum for the period. A royal survey in 1343 suggested that at least a further £684 would be needed to complete the castle, but this was never invested. Bumeris Castle was never fully built, but had it been completed it would probably have closely resembled Harlech Castle. Both castles are concentric in plan, with walls within walls, although Bumeris is the more regular in design. Historian Arnold Taylor described Bumeris as Britain's most perfect example of symmetrical concentric planning and for many years the castle was regarded as the pinnacle of military engineering during Edward I's reign. This evolutionary interpretation is now disputed by historians, Bumeris was as much a royal palace and symbol of English power as it was a straightforward defensive fortification. Nonetheless, the castle is praised by UNESCO as a unique artistic achievement for the way in which it combines characteristic 13th-century double-wall structures with a central plan and for the beauty of its proportions and masonry. Bumeris Castle was built at around sea level on top of the till and other sediments that form the local coastline, and was constructed from local angle sea stone from within 10 miles 16 kilometers, of the site, with some stones brought along the coast by ship, for example from the limestone quarries at Benmon. The stone was a mixture of limestone, sandstone and green schists, which was used fairly randomly within the walls and towers. The use of schists ceased after the pause in the building work in 1298 and as a result is limited to the lower levels of the walls. The castle design formed an inner and an outer ward, surrounded in turn by a moat, now partially filled. The main entrance to the castle was the gate next the sea, next to the castle's tidal dock that allowed it to be supplied directly by sea. The dock was protected by a wall later named the Gunner's Walk and a firing platform that may have housed a trebuchet siege engine during the medieval period. The gate next the sea led into an outer barbican, protected by a drawbridge, arrow slits and murder holes, leading on into the outer ward. The outer ward consisted of an eight-sided curtain wall with twelve turrets enclosing an area approximately 60 feet. 18 meters, across, one gateway led out to the gate next the sea, the other, the Lanfas Gate, led out to the north side of the castle. The defenses were originally equipped with around 300 firing positions for archers, including 164 arrow slits, although 64 of the slits close to the ground level have since been blocked in to prevent them being exploited by attackers, either in the early 15th century or during the Civil War. The walls of the inner ward were more substantial than those of the outer ward, 36 foot, 11 meters, high and 15.5 foot, 4.7 meters, thick, with huge towers and two large gatehouses, enclosing a 0.75 acre, 0.30 hectares, area. The inner ward was intended to hold the accommodation and other domestic buildings of the castle, with ranges of buildings stretching along the west and east sides of the ward. Some of the remains of the fireplaces for these buildings can still be seen in the stonework. It is uncertain if these ranges were actually ever built or if they were constructed but later demolished after the Civil War. If finished, the castle would have been able to host two substantial households and their followers for example the king and queen, or the king, queen and a prince and his own wife. 